Okay. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today to this Ask the Experts webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about building a comprehensive slope monitoring program. We've got our panel of experts here, and I will formally introduce them in just a minute. But before I do that, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Geotechnical Center of Excellence uh, we are putting on this webinar today, also known as the GCE. We're part of the University of Arizona. Um, we're in the School of Mining and Mineral Resources. And we are an industry-funded and member-led organization. Uh, we pride ourselves on an interdisciplinary and collaborative uh, approach to geotechnical research and education. And uh, we also uh, bridge gaps within and between academia, industry, and fields of study. As I mentioned, we are uh, member-funded and member-led. So I want to give a huge shout out to our member companies, which are listed here. Without them, none of this would be possible. Um, so a uh, huge shout out to them. If anybody um, watching today would like to become a, a member, please reach out to us. You can email us at Arizona .edu, uh, gce at arizona.edu, or you can find us on Facebook, or not Facebook, I'm sorry, LinkedIn. We're not on Facebook. Um, or you can track us down at any uh, conference and, and just um, chat with us. We'd be happy to have you. So this webinar is based on our Slope Performance Monitoring Professional Development course. Uh, this is a fully online course made for uh, professionals. Um, it is also um, on demand. You can take it at your own pace. It covers the topics um, listed below. It is one of uh, four professional development courses that we offer. If you'd like to learn more, you can follow the QR code uh, posted here. Okay. Now we'll get into some introductions. So this is our GCE webinar team. Um, I will be your moderator today. My name is James McNabb. I'm a senior research and development engineer with the GCE. And I am joined by my colleagues, Benjamin Meyer. He is a software engineer with the GCE. Thank you for joining, Benjamin. Thank you, James. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We're happy to see you. And I'm also joined by Allison Brucey. She is our program coordinator. Thanks for joining, Allison. Thanks, James. Thank you everybody for being here. So Benjamin and Allison will be working behind the scenes, uh, making sure everything is running smoothly and fielding your live questions as well. So now to get into our expert panel, um, unfortunately, Brett Maurer could not be here today. He is a senior geotechnical engineer with Nevada Gold Mines. Um, he's busy on site, um, but hopefully he can join us at some point. Um, I told him he can tune in whenever. So if he happens to tune in, we will welcome him. Next, we have Megan Gaida. She's a principal geotechnical engineer with Rio Tinto, and she is joining us very early in the morning from Australia. So thank you for joining, Megan. Th thank you. No, I'm excited to be here. L looking forward to all these great questions. Next, we have Ray Yost. He's a senior specialist in rock mechanics with Tetra Tech. Thank you, Ray, for joining. Yeah, this should be fun. Looking forward to the questions as well. Some good discussion. And next we have Graham Dick. He is a senior geotechnical engineer with BGC Engineering. Thank you for joining, Graham. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Okay, so just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, so as a participant, you are muted and your video is off, so don't worry about any of that. If you'd like to ask a question to our panel, um, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen um, on Zoom. Um, there is a chat function and a Q&A. Um, we encourage you to use both, but the chat is more for chatting, things like that. If you have a specific question, though, please post it in the Q&A. You can also um, uh, put one of the panelists' names um, in the Q&A if you'd like to like it to be directed at a specific panelist. Um, you can also vote for questions in the Q&A uh, panel. So if there's a question that somebody else posted that you really like, you can give it a thumbs up, and we'll, we'll see that, and we can kind of high-grade them. Um, this also is a recorded webinar just so you know, and we will be posting it to our YouTube um, after this. Um, so before we get started, let's take a quick poll. I can figure out how to do this real quick. And so this will just be a, a single question um, just to get a feel for every um, everybody's experience. Okay, hopefully you can all see that. So the question is, what is your experience with slope monitoring? So you can just select the one that um, that you feel best describes you. So, well, you guys can read them. <laughs> so we, get, we got a bunch coming in already.
this just helps us get an idea of the uh, uh, audience. Okay, looks like we got quite a few people who have worked directly with slope monitoring. Let's give it a couple more seconds here. Looks like it's slowed down. I'll go ahead and end it at one minute here. Three, two, one. Okay. Let's go ahead and share these results here. Hopefully you guys can see the results. So it looks like we've got 43% have worked directly um, with a slope, uh, slope monitoring program. 46% have not, but they are familiar. And 11% uh, do not work with a slope monitoring program and are not familiar with the concept. So great. Thank you for doing that. We just wanted to get a kind of a an idea, a cross section of of um, those uh, participating today. Okay, so now let's dive into some questions. We'll start it off with a kickoff discussion. So I will uh, I'll read this and then I will I'll start with um, I'll start with Graham since he's at the top of of uh, my screen here. So nearly every aspect of slope monitoring has improved significantly over the last decade. However, the geotechnical challenges we face as an industry have seemingly matched pace with these improvements. In your opinion, what advancements in slope monitoring do you A, expect to see, and B, hope to see in the coming decade? So I'll start with you, Graham. Sure. Um, yeah, I guess I'll start with some of the, um, some of the monitoring programs that are out there in, in industry. And I find that they've really come along in terms of plotting data and plotting different instruments on similar plots. But I think there seems to be still a bit of a lack of integrating the geology side to some of those programs, you know, being able to maybe uh, bring your 3D model in, cut sections, that kind of thing. So I'd like to see, and hopefully um, you'll see in the more, more coming integration with the, the 3D models, block models with, uh, with the monitoring data and visualization. Great, thank you for that. I'll kick it over to Megan. Yeah, so some things that are sort of, you know, already well on their way, and I do expect to see, uh, you know, the, the thermal camera work that the GCE is doing and, and that rockfall tracking, you know, that, that gives us the opportunity for some really widespread and affordable coverage. So it's not just the big mining companies that can have that, but, you know, we could see that used more widely across the board. I, th I think that has great potential. Um, and then the wireless downhole instruments. So right now there's like the GeoForsight. Um, I'm sure there'll be others that come on the market where, you know, even if you mine through a collar, you can still maintain some some continuous monitoring and, and track what's happening in the subsurface. So I think they're, they're the spaces I'm particularly keen to see some more development in. And um, yeah, like, like Graham said, that that improved aggregation and interpretation you know, bringing in some of those AI tools and, and building digital twins so we can see, you know, the geology plus the monitoring um, plus the analysis all, all in one space. I think that's that's really where I hope we can get to. Fantastic. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, Ray? There was a, as far as the equipment, there's those down hole smart markers that they're the radio communication. So even if the thing gets cut off, you're still getting data submitted up through the uh, the column of these of these markers. In terms of instrumentation, it would be pretty neat to see that that advance. Uh, in terms of some of the other processing and whatnot, uh, this is where you know we have all these different data streams coming in, and we treat them individually. And it'd be nice to see them kind of integrated into more of a predictive model. Uh, right now, we have you know like say inverse velocity is a good predictive tool, but it's just sort of based only on one data stream, it'd be nice to be able to pull multiple data streams into a predictive model. You might see a pull pressure drop and an increase in you know, all, all these different things that can say like, yep, your, your probability of failure is increasing or time to failure or whatever. But you're using a lot more uh, data uh, to make those assessments. And I think there's a, a good question coming up on, on the use of uh, machine learning and AI, and maybe that's a, a better place to talk about some of that. Perfect. All right. Thank you. For, thank you all for that. And I think um, Ray, we'll just go to that question. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Which yeah, is, this uh, is... yeah, I'll, I'll read it out uh, real quick. Um, this is from um, Alexei. Uh, what about using AI 
slash machine learning for detecting and measuring slope movements. This is actually from one of our previous webinars, but we didn't get to it. So I, th I thought I would throw it in here. Um, so Ray, if you want to kick us off. Sure. Um, you know, detecting and measuring is, uh, well, the two are sort of very different things. Detecting is certainly good. You can go back and look at what you see as the first, you know, definable moment of, uh, you know, slope failure. You might have to go back and look at some data to see that. But then in terms of measuring and looking at risk and whatnot, I, I go back to a paper that a colleague and I had worked on. When we were looking at these different data streams, we had three different monitor types on a slope and they were getting very different answers sometimes. And you'd have to make these decisions on, um, you know, what is the actual risk based on radar and, and GPS and PRISM data? And, you know, sometimes the PRISM data would be saying one thing and the radar would be saying something else. And we started to look at like, okay, let's, let's think about all these different cases there could be that we would rely on one or the other or both or all three. And we've started out figuring like, well, there's probably about 20 different cases. And we started to look at all the possibilities and there's well over a thousand, you know, which is beyond anybody's ability to sort of sort through like this is saying this and that's saying this and this other thing saying this, what could it be? So I think that's actually a great place for, for AI and machine learning to start to take these multiple data streams and, and make these decisions, you know, around you know, whatever logic you want to program into it to give us a really good sense of what the aggregate um, data streams are telling us about the potential for, for slope displacement and, and certainly slope uh, failure. So I think that's a, a great place for, uh, for that use. And then, uh, you know, anywhere where uh, some of the particular failures that you have, especially brittle failures, is an area that we don't do so well with, with monitoring. Sometimes our cycle times of just reading them can be longer than the time it takes to go from stability to instability. And that's a great place too to be looking at those sort of um, uh, micro movements that are going to start to tell us, like, yep, something's happening here. So those are a couple areas that I can think of off the top of my head that'd be a great place for uh, for artificial intelligence and machine learning. Great, thank you, Ray. Graham or Megan, do you like to chime in on this? Just on the, I guess on a related note, just on point clouds and mapping and, and using LIDAR scans, I think, you know, machine learning comes in on just doing doing the work for us on the mapping side of things. Uh, you know, you're collecting some of this data, whether it's for assault monitoring or design reconciliation, but I think that's a, a in the future, like a really good, good use for this. Yeah, and, and I'm sure it's progressed since I've seen it last, but the the radar vendors are certainly working on bringing um, the AI technology into the, into their software platforms to help with the detection side of things. Um, so it can learn from patterns of previous slope failures and help differentiate noise from, from mm -hmm. early movement onset. Yeah, so, really so I think fun. you'll see that being cool. packaged out as part of the, the provider mm -hmm. offering. Yeah, that, that signal to noise ratio is a really good point. Because that's mm. that's pretty key to a lot of things. Excellent. Thank you all for that. Looks like we have a live question that came in. Um, so this is sort of in reference to the the kickoff question. To incorporate the geology into into the models, what specific information needs to be incorporated? This is from Dane. Thank you, Dane. So again, this is from kind of stemming from the uh, the kickoff discussion question. So I think um, maybe I'll kick it off to to Graham. I believe you had mentioned the incorporation of of the geology models. Yeah, I think in in its basic form, your geotechnical units or lithology units and faults essentially. You know, I guess the whatever at your site particularly influences the stability of your pit walls. Um, and then from that point, you'd bring in your design sectors and and be able to check your, your design reconciliation with the design and the performance of your walls. So in that sense, uh, if you have some prisms on a wall or radar, you can see perhaps if that's related to some um, some specific structure, maybe influencing the, the displacement with the, that you have in your model already, or maybe you could add it to your model. Right. One of the things too that we see often is this uh, contrast in stiffness, and um, mm -hmm. and that causes all sorts of different problems with modeling. But you know, you, when you have these really really soft units next to really really stiff units, 
that uh, you know, well, it can create all sorts of different problems, both with the stability analysis, but also with the monitoring. And to have some sense of you know either uh, rock mass characteristics or, or the elastic content or constants for the the various uh, lithologic units uh, that could help as well. Because when you start to see these really weird squirrely results, and you look at this really high contrast and stiffness, that can tell you something about what's going on. Excellent. Anything else? Thank you, Dane, for the question. As well as discrete fault structures, if you've got mm. a, a folded environment, you might want to look at, you know, is your is your bedding rolling over, you know, so a, as Graham was saying, you, you're demaining, um, you know, um, make sure you've identified those domains of different structure orientation um, in your monitoring so you can better explain different behaviours. Actually, add to that point a little bit, um, one of the things that we see a lot of times um, you have a geologic model that's, you've got a structural framework that's put in place to model where the ore occurs, but there's not all the different ancillary features that you know are faults and sometimes large scale faults, but don't necessarily have an offset somewhere. And incorporating those and starting to get a sense of how that might be affecting the stability of the slope could be, could be helpful. One thing to add, just to raise comment on stiffness is that, um, you know, if, you're, if your site collects specific energy data, for example, from your drilling, um, we often plot that and uh, within our block models or on our pitch shells, and that gives you a good sense of what rocks may be you know, weaker than the other or where structures might be happening that aren't quite captured in your model before you actually mine the pit. Great point, yeah. Uh, BGC has a, has a great presentation in our structural geology course on uh, specific energy. It's really, really interesting stuff. Okay, thank you for that. Let's go over to this question here. This is one of the pre-submitted questions. Do you have any advice on what should be done to maximize our learnings and optimize our monitoring program after a failure? I think my team gains knowledge on an individual level after these events, but I would like to have a protocol for us to debrief, share, evaluate, and implement what we learned. It's a really, really important question. Um, I guess I'll, I'll uh, kick it off to Megan. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly applaud this question. I think this would, this is a great practice. And I, I know we, we, we don't always do this. Um, but to, to be thinking about this and planning that is, is a great first step. Um, I think just setting aside a time for a formal debriefing will yield a lot of value. Um, set some ground rules so people feel comfortable sort of talking about um, their concerns as well as the successes. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you could start with just some very simple questions around, you know, what went well? what didn't go well, what would be even better if, and, and just get that dialogue flowing. Um, it doesn't need to be structured as an incident investigation, um, more as a debrief. And, and there's a lot of technical details you, you could discuss, but um, I, I might turn it over to the rest of the panels rather than take up all the time. I think you'd wanna look at your different instruments, um, You know what detected it um, and how much in advance did the alarms go off? Were your isolations um, adequate? And, and sort of work through work through that detailed information in the debrief. Right. You mind if I jump in there, Graham? Unless you yeah. have some sort of compelling point. Please, please do. Yeah. Um, this, I mean, this speaks to, uh, and again, I, I, I join Megan in, in saying this is a great question because it speaks to institutional knowledge retention, which as an industry, we're actually pretty bad at. You know, we'll have people that that learn things and they're, they're really good at, you know, managing these systems and then they leave and go somewhere else and a lot of that stuff is lost. So when I was working at this uh, the last uh, site I was at, we would try to build these uh, two technical program management plans for the whole program, or you could have the ground control management plans, your GCMPs. And that's where you want to start to capture all this stuff. So at least, you know, when the person leaves, it's documented somewhere, you know, to exactly the, the points that she made as far as how was it detected? What was the first sign of detection? You know, how did the instrument work? What didn't work? So that someone else comes along and it's not going to be as as fulsome as, as as someone knowing all this, but it does, it's better than nothing, which is often what happens that when that person leaves, all that knowledge goes with them. So it's uh it's it's important to have those debriefs, but it's also important to document them somewhere that then becomes part of the handover to the next person in those roles. 
Great point. But first, what first came to mind is uh, monitoring itself is a form of detection, and we as humans need to use this information to make decisions. And I would consider how successful the ground control management plan was following this event, and um, you know the tarps that were in place. How did they perform? Is there an opportunity to review um, the event, and then is there any warrant to perhaps update these tarps or the GCMP um, from these learnings? Yeah, yeah, no, the TARP, uh, to, to emphasize that point, is going to be a great place to to capture a lot of that stuff. It's almost like your frontline um, place where it's retained. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I've seen a really nice exercise done recently where a site looked at um, all of their smaller failures and, and saw which ones were detected by the radars, um, which ones were alarmed by the radars, and and you know how, how much in advance it reached certain limits, and they've used that to fine tune their detection thresholds um, so that they're better able to give give earlier warning on on those small events. You know, so a really sort of um, iterative improvement loop. All right, great. Thank you all for that. Really, really good question. Okay, let's jump to here. This is another pre-submitted question. I think this one was from a previous um, panel discussion that we didn't get to as well. How do we optimize slope design and slope monitoring with limited drilling data, test work, and only radar monitoring? Mapping data can only go so far without significant investment in additional below surface data collection. Interesting question. I think I'll um, let's start with Graham. I guess, um, yeah, mapping data, like a lot of mines, I think I would say most have drone photogrammetry for their DTMs and stuff. Like you can, in addition to mapping, you can definitely do change detection with these, uh, with this data, it's essentially a point cloud. I guess the the, the drawback is sometimes the, the limit of detection or how much movement you can actually um, collect with these, this data. Um, would be, that'd be my first thing that jumps to mind in terms of mapping data can only go so far. With uh, with drilling data, you can um, obviously install piezos in your in your um, in your drills drill holes. Uh, but something to consider if the drill hole is near the pit crest is uh, you'll put a couple TDRs in there. Uh, you know they're not too expensive or or difficult to install. Something maybe to consider to to maximize the the data collection that that you have with your minimal drill holes. Great. Anybody else? I kind of take a, a step back a little bit, um, you know, and we're looking at, uh, I mean, there, there's a lot of time packing this question, actually, because you're talking about optimizing slope design and slope monitoring based on limited geomechanical data. So there's sort of these three different pieces that you're trying to weigh against each other. And there's value in all of them. If you look at sort of building your better uh, geomechanical model and, and building your monitoring uh, model, that's going to help your, your slope optimization piece. And you need all three of those to get, or sorry, you need these two to get the third one over here. Mm -hmm. And really, it's a big risk question. You know, you can say, look, you know, you can, there's a value in slope optimization. And it's, it's, it's sort of created by understanding your geomechanical model and your, and your monitoring. And it becomes a value proposition. And this is where it's kind of a strange thing we do in industry sometimes is we really cut these two things short, but we want this third thing. And then it doesn't often work out because we don't know enough about the environment. So the, the area I've worked on this is to try to present it not as a, we don't have enough information, but rather, hey, there's a huge value here that we can unlock if we have this information. And so it becomes this, this cost benefit risk type of proposal to the people making decisions around how to fund all this stuff to say, look, if, if you want this, if you want to unlock this value, we need uh, money over here. And then we have, we're comparing value to value at that point. Hmm. So it's, it's not quite answering the question, but this is where, uh, again, rather than staying in this pattern that we, we have in the industry with trying to do more and more with less and less, it's like, no, let's get more and more value with, with greater investment in in building our geomechanical models or geotechnical models and doing the appropriate monitoring. Yeah, I Great. think right, right, right. You touched on a, a few notes I'd made as well. I think, you know, 
while while you might have limited subsurface data, like an, a mined pit slope is about the best analog you've got for a future mined pit slope, assuming your domains are similar. So, you know, the more you can get from the observations there, the better. If, for example, you're seeing a lot of crest lost on a certain planar structure, well, that, that planar structure may well be your design constraint that you need to optimize to. Um, but, but fully agree, it is a, a risk tolerance and risk-based decision. Right? If, if you're seeking to optimize or do more with less, um, then you are taking on more risk that that plan will, will work out. Um, and, and that will be different from, from site to site. I, I, I do agree if you show the value on the table that that really helps that conversation along. Um, if, if you are limited in your monitoring ability, I, I would give a shout out to INSAR. I think, you know, it's a fairly cost effective way to get a view on what's what's happening in the areas you might need to spend money on. Um, bearing in mind it, it has limitations around line of sight. I think it's a, a good way to get get started on that question. Just to emphasize, that's a really good point about the the empirical behavior. You know, there's all the stuff that we do with forward modeling, but that empirical behavior that's going to be our best our best indication of how things should perform and our best uh, um, indication of what troubles we might expect. Again, in, in similar domains, but uh, yeah, that's there's that's unbeatable as far as as far as slow monitoring and prediction, especially that site specific knowledge oh, yeah exactly yeah. yeah yeah all right excellent thank you for for that everybody um i think this is a good one to follow up with this is from victoria this is a pre-submitted question we recently acquired a radar but have have had an insar for the last year how can i incorporate the insar data into setting up my thresholds for slope movement thank you victoria I think Megan, you may have mentioned INSAR in the last one, so maybe I'll kick it off to you. <laughs> yeah, this this sounds like a problem I'd love to tackle, but I'll, I'll do my, I'll do my best to um, describe how I might go about it. Um, so, you know, certainly the INSAR is going to tell you that areas you for sure want to watch anything that's moving on the INSAR. But um, if you've got a radar on that same slope, then you can start to look at the vectors and the lines of sights and and potentially build some correlations. You know, okay, if I see, you know one inch of movement over the year on my, well, that's probably not the right magnitude. If I see a certain number on my radar and I see half that on the INSA, that kind of lets me scale up what is typical performance and what would be atypical performance. And I can decide from that, um, you know, with how much tolerance I give my, my slopes and my radar alarms. Um, you know, I, I think you will learn a lot as you have that radar and, and you'll probably dial in your thresholds based on what the radar is seeing, but but the INSAR can give you that that screening step. I think it's especially important too, as you go to set up your radar, one of the things that happens a lot is they get the, when you're setting your thresholds, especially and trying to figure out that, that signal to noise ratio, and you're getting a lot of false positives from your alarms having that INSAR data to inform those initial steps where suddenly the site now has to get used to this alarming frequency, maybe a lot of which are, are false alarms. You can reduce a lot of that alarm fatigue by, by having that INSAR data and going through the exact process that, that Megan described. This is looking at that displacement over time and using that to select your, select your thresholds. Mm -hmm. I might add that um, although INSAR and ground-based radar are both radars. Really, INSAR is more of a background monitoring tool. You know, you get a in more infrequent readings in a larger area. And and Megan mentioned some of the limitations just in terms of line of sight, whereas you know, your ground-based radar is really a tactical tool to monitor a slope that you're perhaps you've picked up on your INSAR to monitor more closely. So to me, your thresholds are going to be different between the two tools just based on how they're collecting the data. Um, you may have more of a background threshold rate for your INSAR data, um, where you might have an alarm that's uh, that's triggering beyond more of what's your normal rates, and then your radar would have more, uh, more active monitoring uh, thresholds based on the movements you're collecting. All right. Thank you all for that. Thank you, Victoria, for the question. 
Okay, we've got a couple more live questions here. This one is about AI. This is from Steve. Would AI be great for predictive maintenance? Thank you, Steve. I'm not exactly sure what predictive maintenance, um, but perhaps our panelists have some insight. I'll jump in there unless somebody else has something. Please do. Uh, I've seen it mostly used in um, vehicle maintenance, you know, for your, your truck downtimes and whatnot, when you decide to, to down a piece of equipment uh, because of, you know, tire wear, or, um, parts fatigue or whatever. And yeah, this would be great because uh, this is a huge cost driver that if you down that piece of equipment earlier and pull the tire off before it's just about to go, uh, you, you've essentially wasted you know, some bit of performance you could gotten out of that, that piece of equipment. So I think it would take a little bit of time to look at, you know, how do you bring all these, again, different data streams together to get to this point where you're, you're seeing value and able to extend that that life before you replace that that component, but uh, yeah, it's it would have some promise there for sure. Mm -hmm. And um, apologies if that's what the the Steve didn't mean by predictive maintenance, but that's where I could see it being applied. All right, thank you, Ray. anybody anybody else? I I'm glad Ray got the answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you, Steve. If you'd like to follow up um, with some specifics, we'd be happy to to address them afterwards. Okay. This is sort of a, a broad discuss discussion question, but I'm very excited to see what you all have to say about it. What are some common pitfalls or blind zones you observe in mining or uh, in monitoring programs? I'll kick this off to Ray. How long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> we got... Yeah, quite a while. <laughs> um, well, this is sort of a pet peeve of mine, um, and I, I don't want to dominate the time, but I find sometimes that there's an over-reliance on radars. They're great tools, and they do specific things, and they do those specific things very well. But it's where I've seen it is that people think, like, oh, we have a radar. All of our problems are solved because we have this really sophisticated tool. And it's great, but we often need a lot of different things. We have other, um, you know, things we have to monitor that the radars aren't good for. And then of course, there's all the technical bits of it in terms of line of sight and angles and uh, paramovement versus real movement and whatnot. But it's it's one of these things where I, I know I've seen this happen you know, numerous times where the site will dedicate all its resources to a radar. And the other thing that happens as well with that is they've gotten better. We won't name names as far as what radar systems I've found to be really good, but some of them can require a lot of babysitting to the point that I've seen sites abandon them because they can't get anything else done. So they have this incredible tool that they've sunk all this money in and they don't use it because it sucks up all the personnel time. So it's a matter of just sort of being strategic about how you're monitoring and understanding what that tool does and how much other time and, and resources it's gonna require and, and what that means for the rest of your systems. I'll turn it over to, to Graham and Megan. <laughs> Sure, I can jump in. I, I would say that uh, I definitely agree with you, Ray, on that one. And I really miss seeing prism data at some of the sites. Like I really, it's, um, I guess, you know, when the radar comes in, you know, prisms just aren't getting installed sometimes. And I know it's a manual process, but I find that um, the data, because it's 3D data that you collect, just provides so much more um, more like you no know, more for your interpretations, not only to help set up your radar for line of sight, but looking at um, you know blind spots that your radar doesn't cover, as well as in terms of interpreting a failure mechanism potentially. Great points. Yeah. Megan. Yeah, I I too have a bit of a laundry list like like Ray, but I think it's um mm. it's in the details, right? It's it's thinking well, I've got it, so I don't need to worry about anything else. Um, you know, not updating masks as mining progresses, so mm. or get you know masks getting out of control, and so movement occurs, but is is filtered out because of the you know the different noise management systems, um, the the line of sight factors not being accounted for, so movement is underestimated or not well detected because the the vectors are are um, very misaligned with with the look direction. Um, not looking for negative movement as well as positive movement. Um, 
so so missing stuff because your your legend is only set to go one way. Um, and and a hundred percent agree with the prisms. I I saw a, a great paper at um, um Brazil from um Tech Cole uh Brad Leconte, Lecomte, um where they they had a prism on a daylighted wedge failure that that crept for like six years and then a year prior to failure it accelerated and so this prism was was telling the story a year before this wedge failure came down um well before but um because it wasn't part of the routine maintenance or routine monitoring program um that wasn't detected until failure was imminent so they could see it in hindsight and they were very transparent about sharing that which was which was fantastic um but I think we have a tendency to set and forget some of those long-term monitoring tools and, and they can yield huge value if we're rigorous about checking in on those, like what's this been doing for the past year? Like taking a long-term view. Very, very good points. It's Ray, looks like you wanna chime in. Oh yeah, and just another one that I run into is uh... I wouldn't say it's over-reliance is the right word on geotechs, but sort of putting all the burden on the geotech person to, yeah. to, to be that interpreter. You know, there's, there's a lot of subtleties in interpreting monitoring data, and it shouldn't be that anybody could do this. But a lot of times that, that geotech becomes the, the, the pinch point for it, for that information flow. And really getting people to understand, you know, what does this mean when you're seeing this? Uh, because everybody ultimately has a stake in in understanding monitoring and taking appropriate actions uh, based on the monitoring results. And it doesn't mean that everybody has to be a monitoring expert, but you know, even your truck drivers, anybody that's going to go into that environment should at least have an awareness of what the, the fundamental data means and, and be able to, to get a sense or ask even good questions as far as what it means. So sort of putting all of that burden on the geotech to say, okay, you know, here's all this stuff, and then you know, do this. I think uh, you know, kind of, uh, it's, it, I guess it's a good blind zone in terms of you're you're limiting who can do that, and really it should be as many people as possible should be doing this, not just a, a handful of specialists. It's a, it's great, a balance great between, point. yeah between you know, sort of knowledge and, and you know, people knowing enough to be dangerous, but we've got to find a place that's a better balance than just having yeah. uh, two or three people on site that are responsible for that. Sure, yeah, it's, good. it's quite a bottleneck if, if people are sick, people are out, people yeah. quit. It's dark, it's night, you know, people are asleep. Yep, yeah, good points. Great, well, I, I love the soapbox talks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's yeah. jump to a, uh, live question here for if we're if we're done with that one. I yeah, we're, I think we're done. We could we could go a long way on it, but <laughs> I'm sure we could. Yeah, we've covered, yeah. Some, yeah, we've covered we'll, some some good points. We'll get to some live questions here. Okay, what can what can we start with to set thresholds when we don't have enough data or background history? Thank you. I don't know how to pronounce it exactly. Um, Chow. We sort of talked a little bit about this in one of the previous questions. Got an idea. Yeah. I don't know how to answer. It's a yeah. tricky one. Yeah, it's a really good question. Yeah. I mean, we, we do see sort of this relationship between uh, material hardness and then you know, brittleness and then the speed of failure. Hmm. So I think the first place to start is how hard or soft is the material. And then you can set thresholds appropriate or, or related to that. For the softer material, typically you're going to have that, that more plastic behavior for a little bit. So you've got some time to kind of figure it out. Um, with the more brittle material, you have to be a little bit more conservative because you may not have much time to figure it out. So I would say the first place to start might be just with how hard or soft is the, is the, the rock mass. And... Um, use that to either set a, if it's softer, which a lot of uh, mines are, uh, just because of the nature of the, the alteration that goes on, um, you can set a pretty high threshold to reduce those false positives. But if you're in really, really hard, brittle rocks, um, you just, you might have to accept those, the initial period of false positives. Mm -hmm. And on that one too, it becomes a, a communications issue because 
it's one thing to to set thresholds low and get a lot of false alarms. Okay, great. But um, you don't want people to get that alarm fatigue. And, and you want to either, if you're, if that's going out public, you know, that, that the, the site-wide people are being exposed to these false alarms, you got to let them know that, hey, we're sorting this out, whatever. You got to tell them to, to get them aware of that. Or you just do it internally and, and get that threshold narrowed down to reduce those false positives. But uh, anyway, rock, uh, rock uh, hardness is a, is a place to start at least. Yeah, and I guess building on that, if you can find a case study, um, some failure case studies in a similar um, setting, you know, same kind of ore body, same kind of lithology. Um, people do sometimes publish their, um, you know, rates prior to failure and the alarm thresholds used. So you could use that as a, a starting point with a, with a little bit of legwork. Um, and, and then looking at that signal to noise ratio we've talked about a couple of times. So, um, if you're getting quite a lot of atmospheric noise, you may need to use a slightly longer baseline for your, you know, displacement over time calculation. There's that clearinghouse in Arizona that brings together a lot of mining companies and monitoring companies and consultants. I can't think of the name of it. Yeah. I'll try to get a hold of them. Yeah, you might ask them. <laughs> they, they, could, uh, they could tap into a worldwide network of experts that they can help out. <laughs> Good idea. From my, thoughts? Yeah. yeah, from my experience, it doesn't take too long after you set up your monitoring system to get some sort of background or, or baseline uh, displacement. So if you're, you don't really want to set thresholds right off the bat, but just keep a close eye for the first little bit, of course, to see what that baseline rate is for your, your own site. Yeah, it seems like getting back to, I think, one of the one of the soapbox box talks was... Um, not being over reliant on one monitoring system when you're when you're looking at setting these these thresholds, making sure that you've got redundancy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. It's got a couple more live questions here. So in fully monitored geotechnical environments, can we apply the minimum DAC by LOP's guideline? This is from, I apologize, I'm going to mispronounce this, uh, Resh. And I see. <laughs> <laughs> you want to take that, Ray? Well. Sure. I, I'd be curious as far as your, uh, your, well, both of you too as well. But um, it was actually a really good talk in the recent slope stability conference about this performance-based design and, and going down to very low factors of safety. And this is something my colleagues and I talked about quite a bit where actually starting to develop a paper on how do you balance uh, factor safety against uh, risk management systems? Uh, we're almost advocating for designing it, you know, a factor safety of 0.9, you know, because you're, you're substituting monitoring and, and, um, and understanding what the slope is doing for the design side. I mean, the two work hand in hand, actually. You can design to very high factor safety and have low monitoring requirements or vice versa or balance them out depending on your risk tolerance profile. We're at a point where the, the, the uh, <clears throat> DAC guidelines in LLP are kind of the industry standard, but, but I think there's a lot of value to be gained from starting to push back on that. And as the geotechnical community, you know, we can be the ones to do that to say, look, you know, you can get to the same place because it's about managing risk by having uh, you know, lower factor safety, but increased or you know, vastly increased monitoring. So, I would say provisionally, yes, um, you can get down to these these minimum uh, design acceptance criteria or lower uh, by you know following your your uh, by you know showing that monitoring is is really managing that risk appropriately. Some of it depends on the regulatory environment that you're in. You know, you can go to one state or province and it's sure I've at it. Other ones are like no nope, BAC, that's it. So. But from an industry perspective, um, Megan, what the, what's your thought on all this? Yeah, so I think um, I think it comes down to the risk appetite of the business. I think that if, if it's fully monitored, um, you know, and you're applying that DAC, I, I think what you're saying with that monitoring is is you can keep people safe, right? You can keep people out of harm's way if something were to occur. Um, it doesn't 
um, guarantee or doesn't assure that you won't have slope instabilities that cost the business money. So I think that decision still needs to be made by the business as to what DAC they feel comfortable with from, from an economic perspective. Um, and unless you're, you know, going down into the route of, you know, monitoring alone keeps people safe. If it's monitoring and adjusting, then you're doing observational mining and you're, you know, you're making changes on the fly based on that monitoring. Potentially, you know, you, you can operate in a different DAC territory there. Hmm. You know, that that's really what, what happens with observational mining. Uh, so, yeah, I'd say yes, if your business appetite, risk appetite supports that. And it was mentioned, uh, you know, that your excavated pit is, you know, your best proxy to you know, how your slopes are going to perform, perhaps in a pushback or a different part of the mine. And really like the empirical based design coming from that, I think is definitely warranted. And then if you're using the mine and monitor method, um, you know, I think I agree with, you know, Ray and Megan about shifting from, you know, your 2D, 3D limit equilibrium to get your factor of safety based on your mon your, your best guess at the model to using some of that empirical data and, and rely more on your monitoring to uh, uh, on your on the risk side of things. Hmm. Very good, very interesting question. All right, we've got a, another, I think really interesting live question here from Jean-Luc. Do we still need to spend money in data collection by drilling if we think we have enough money to put in place an accurate monitoring system? Whatever the rock mass is, the monitoring system in place will tell us where where there is movement in the slope and we can manage risk safely. Thank you, Jean-Luc. Very interesting question. Follow up from the last one. I could start. start. Yeah, we'll yeah please, Grant. <laughs> I guess I... Um... You, if uh, if you're drilling a new site, that you really don't know where to start as well. Uh, so you guys, you need to leave some flexibility in your mind plan if you're going to use this. You're just going to monitor. Um, I guess I'll just put that out there. Yeah. Part of this too, it it comes down to the the information you're getting back. Um, if you are in a very structured system and you're and you're drilling and from drill hole to drill hole to drill hole, you're getting a very low coefficient of variation in your data, whatever it is, you know, compressive strength or shear strength or whatever. I would say, yeah, at a certain point, it doesn't really make sense to keep drilling and, and understanding the same thing. But if you're seeing that high variability and, and, and that high coefficient of variation in your data, you know, it's it's that balance between, you know, hey, there's a pretty high potential that we don't know everything here. We probably should keep trying to understand this geotechnical environment. Um, this is again like what I was saying before, like the slope design, the monitoring, and the geotechnical model all work hand in glove. And you're trying to find that optimal point at which you know you've you haven't you know spent all of your money in one place and not enough in other places. And that's that balance between those two very different components of, of overall risk management. So, and I think that the, the place to look for that balance is that, that coefficient of variation and the data you're getting back. You know, if you're seeing broader and broader and broader variation, it probably means there's a lot more uncertainty and you don't know enough yet. But if you're just getting pretty consistent results, yeah, you're probably pretty good. Yeah, I guess the way this question is posed it makes it sound, sound as though we're saying maybe you don't need any drilling, just mine and monitor and and adapt as you get there. Um, that, that's a pretty extreme end member. I'd say it's not just enough just to know where it's moving. You really need to understand why it's moving as well, right? Because if you're coming up with mitigation plans and monitoring strategies, you need to understand what the mechanism is that, that's causing the observations you're seeing. And I don't think you can understand the mechanisms if you don't have a good understanding of the, the geological, the geotechnical, the structural setting and the hydrogeological conditions. And, and getting an understanding of that, that takes time, you know, and if, if you want to be, I guess, proactive and, and have a plan in place versus reactive and, and yet yeah, needing, needing flexibility in your mind plan, accepting delays, I think they're philosophical operating decisions you're making at that point. I, I do think you need to spend the money on data collection upfront, at least to a point. 
and that's actually a really good point about being proactive versus reactive. Um, either one can work. Uh, being reactive, um, you know, is a lot more expensive usually. Uh, I've had, you know, this one case study that was really intense sort of how uh, being proactive versus reactive because the two were so close together. We presented uh, management with a, a proactive solution for whatever it was, a quarter million dollars. And they said, no, we don't want to do this. And within a month, they had to react to the failure that we had predicted. And it was two and a half million dollars to fix it. It was like, okay, that's about a 10 to one ratio between being proactive versus reactive. You know, ended up where the, the slope was stabilized, but the, the one path forward was a whole lot more expensive than the other one. So, um, yeah, I, I like that. Uh, you know, if you have enough flexibility within your mind plan, which some places I've seen do, you know, they've got enough exposures that, and this was actually a site I had worked at, the, um, they didn't really have any understanding of the geotechnical environment, but they had such a vast uh, um, site open, this, this pit you know, had been developed and they would say, okay, we'll mine, if it fails, we'll just mine over there and we'll clean that up and it'll be fine. And it worked for a long time, but eventually they'd catch up with them. They had some pretty massive failures that almost put them out of business. So uh, it can work, but it's very, very rare instances where it works well over the long term. Great. Well, very, very interesting question, Jean-Luc. Thank you for that. And we actually have an, another question from Jean-Luc, sort of sort of related in that it's it's about kind of uh, what data do we need? Um, it's more about the structural geology. Should we continue to consider joints as weakness zones in the rock mass? From my point of view, this is not important because joints are rarely persistent to a point where they can lead to a failure at the scale of two benches. For me, bedding planes are the structures that can lead to a failure involving more than one bench. It's an interesting, interesting question, Jean-Luc. You want to tackle this one, Grant? Yeah, I saw, we, uh, in, my, in my designs, we often will do a ranking for uh, design sets and, and all that, um, depending on if they're, you know, related to different larger structures within the, the pit or the geological model. So I would, you know, I agree that, you know, perhaps joints are more considered on the bench scale, which, um, which is very often the case. And the bedding planes are, of course, more persistent to the, the, um, the, the geological model. So, yeah, I think I agree with Jean-Luc that perhaps, you know, it's more on the bench scale that, you know, the joints specifically um, is what you would maybe want to focus your design on. I think that's I, I guess, yeah, yeah I, I think what, what you do get, though, even though they're not persistent, is if you have a, a fabric of um, joints all at the same orientation, you do get that ubiquitous weakness, which which I've certainly seen contribute to failures. They, they may often also have a, you know, a bedding plane component to them, but um, I've seen quite a lot release relating to a, a joint fabric as at least a contributor to the mechanism. So. Mm -hmm. I think it's important we we understand them and, and consider them. Yeah, that uh, that percent rock bridging um, is is pretty key because you can. Well, I've you know, worked on ones where the the whether it's stable or not really depends on what the assumption is you make around percent rock bridging, and it can be you know five percent doesn't work, but uh, ten or fifteen percent it, it's stable. And so that uh, even it's even though it's a, just a series of joints, it's that bridging between the joints that becomes the the key factor, which ties into your your joint spacing distribution and length distribution. I also see this as being sensitive, where you have maybe major structures that control, and you'll have a major structure that comes down, and there's some offset between the, the toe of the slope and the major structure, and that that breakout zone where the failure plane comes down along the major structure and then cuts through the rock mass. Uh, that'll be heavily influenced by uh, joints through there. And if there's a joint that's even subparallel to that orientation, uh, that can certainly be a, a key contributor to, to overall slope failure. So it's, it's a fairly, I don't know, it's almost case by case basis, whether you 
whether you'd consider them or not. There's there are certainly cases where you wouldn't, and other cases where they're absolutely critical. It's a little bit of a tough uh, question to answer in a general sense. Yeah, re really good points. It, it seems like, um, I mean, I would say most large scale slope failures that are structurally controlled or bedding controlled um, are complex, right? They do involve rock mass, um, joint fabrics. Um, while they might be dominantly be released on a bedding plane or fault, there usually is a component of of um, a fabric and, and linking joints together, step path failure. So, um, but yeah, it's certainly case by case as, as Ray mentioned. All right. Well, that that is the last of the questions that we have right now. We have a couple minutes. Um, I guess I want to open it up um, in case uh, anybody has um, more that they'd like to say on their soapbox. Um, those are always fun. Um, I can I can open it up. Um, we've got about five minutes um, just as it relates to building a comprehensive slope monitoring program. Any any words of wisdom? I can uh, I could start. I've seen um, kind of both both sides of a slope monitoring program where the site will will spend a lot of money on on new in uh, uh, tools, downhole tools, geoforce all that. I guess I would just say to to think about the goals of your monitoring program and if um, you know if you want to kind of do some of that R and D side of things or um, you know if there's some middle ground that that will uh, they'll match the risk your risk tolerance to the type of instrumentation that. Uh, that you should consider. Great, thanks, Graham. Yeah, and related to that, I think is is matching your your monitoring to the to the situation. Um, you know, and again, it's sort of this is my sore point. People won't go out and buy a radar right away, but there's a lot of other steps you can take progressively before that. Uh, early in my career, this was before radars were invented, so you know, this is back in the dark ages. Uh, we were monitoring, a, you know, what turned into a, a 40 million ton slope failure with two pegs banged into the ground and a tape measure, you know, and you'd go out and you'd you know, measure across this thing every day and then have this chart that was built by hand, essentially. Now, was that ideal? No, but uh, it does speak to being able to monitor very large scale slope failures with very simple tools. And sometimes, you know, you don't need the the uh, the most complicated thing to to accomplish a lot. Mm -hmm. All right. Megan, guess, any final words? You know, I think we've covered a lot of ground, so I'm, I'm scratching around for what we haven't talked about. But um, I think if you don't have some basic weather station monitoring, that is a useful mm. investment. You know, looking at your um, temperatures for your freeze-thaw cycles and, and your precipitation um, and, and your um, snow, snow accumulation, if that's your environment. Um, there's often some really relevant correlations to your slope performance. And if you've got site specific data, um, that can really be helpful because, you know, go, go away five kilometers or to your nearest like, you know, city weather station, the answer might be completely different. Yeah. Very good point. Yeah. No, excellent. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm just going to close out real quick um, by mentioning again that this webinar is, is based on our slope performance monitoring professional de development course. Um, if you'd like to learn more, you can follow the QR code. It's one of four courses that we offer. And with that, um, I'd like to thanks every thank you everybody again. Thank to, thanks to our panelists, our participants. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate your time. Uh, it was a great discussion. So thank you all. Anytime. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks for, for having us. us. Yeah. Okay. Take care, everybody. Everybody have a good day. Take care.